Smexy, ladies and gentlemen, I have been really looking forward to making this video ever since I reviewed the first The Evil Within game only a couple months ago. Highly recommend you watch that video if you have not already by the way. Put a lot of work into it and I feel I truly gave the first game the justice it deserves as a fan of survival horror. Speaking of justice, I have been thinking about how I would do the same for The Evil Within 2 as I have a very strange relationship with this game and I think many in fact do. You have fans such as myself who played the first game, loved everything about it and were frankly disappointed with the second entry. My memory of this game was that it was fun and had its moments but was easily a lesser survival horror experience compared to the first entry. Having just beat the game yet again and having both entries fresh in my mind, I have decided how I would cover this game. You're going to hear about the things that Evil Within 2 does really well and even better than the original. You're going to learn about some changes that confuse me and the things I outright dislike. Let's start with the good stuff first. An immediate positive I have with the Evil Within 2 is easily its graphics and their custom version of the id engine rebranded STEM engine. The same engine that powers the Doom games. The first The Evil Within game is still a looker to this day and if you saw my recent review of that you know I loved the visual eye candy so much. It was also Tango Gameworks first game and three years later The Evil Within 2 looks even better. What I especially loved was its aggressive use of the depth of field while aiming with any weapon. Whatever you're looking directly at will be in crisp focus, but everything around, both in the foreground and background, receive a high quality out of focus blur effect. It adjusts in real time and very smoothly. Depth of field was something I praised in the first game and it's nice to see such a nice focus of it here. Everything looks clean and crisp. Effects like fire, electricity and even blood really pops on the screen. Let's jump to another thing I enjoyed about The Evil Within 2 because remember this is the positive part of the video, we will discuss the less fun stuff later on. So I really like the enemy designs in this game and how you have different classes. So you have the usual grunts, zombie like dudes and also female counterparts. This is great because it never feels like I'm fighting the same monster all the time. There is a greater female presence in this game as well, since a female character is now the core. So as far as the lore is concerned that makes sense. And as I said, the variety is nice. Anyway, there is a certain monster which I love. I came across this scary girl just walking around in a white gown, holding a butcher knife with a ran out of medication crazy look in her eyes and just from a design standpoint I loved it. She looks cooked but not too different from the others. I decided I'd take her down via stealth, something you do often in this game and those stealth kills kill the enemy. Trusty knife to the head and move on. But not this crazy bee, no no no. As she throws me off her, this was the first time someone survived a takedown and really gave me this shite just got real moment. I blasted her with an arrow from my crossbolt that does electrical damage and somehow she is still coming at me. Eventually I kill her but what a fun rush it was. The tempo of this game suddenly changed and I loved that. I can only imagine how much harder it would have been if I had not first rammed a knife in her head. Speaking of stealth, The Evil Within 2 expands on it further and I welcome its addition. You use stealth a fair bit in The Evil Within 1 and it makes a return with some nice improvements. A little white arrow appears on any surface you can cling or hide with and if you press the correct button, Sebastian, the main character you play as the detective, will run to that cover spot. Using this trick, you can jump from one cover to the next and a small detail I especially liked in one of those rare moments where this game outshined the original was in its variety in stealth takedowns. So in the first game, every single takedown was exactly the same. The same angle, the same animation, the same everything and it felt strange. 
Now you have several different takedown animations from the back for standing and one where you're still crouched and another when you do a stealth takedown from the front which is a fun addition is something that you can unlock. Even more impressive is if you perform a takedown on any of the special enemies that roam about the place. Crazy Med's white gown lady is only one of several special monsters lurking about. The animation plays out completely different which felt like a nice treat. One enemy you literally even climbed them in order to do that takedown. A new feature that I think console players will especially appreciate is the aiming lock on feature. The first game copped a bit of slack because it was a bit too realistic for some players. If you wanted a headshot in that game, you had to be aiming for the head exactly. No such thing is close enough. While this is still true in The Evil Within 2, at the start of the game, you can opt to have a lock-on feature if you want it. I struggle for headshots with the mouse, so with thumbsticks on a console, I'm sure that this is a very appreciated feature. Next up, let's talk about the most controversial feature of The Evil Within 2, and that is how open zoned the game is. You can explore a whole town as you see fit. Explorable houses, shops, and even open fields are an option to you. Some love this feature, and some felt it went against everything that is survival horror, and especially what the first game was about. This is the first main example of the developers listening to feedback a bit too much. An overcorrection, which was doing a complete change instead of finding a middle ground. Some of the criticism of the first game, from those who did not like that game in the first place, was its linear storytelling design. While there were areas you could explore a bit, there were also parts where you followed a set path. A middle ground approach here would have been for The Evil Within 2 to follow the same structure as the first, but expand on it a bit further. Still guide the player, but expand further the explorable possibilities. The team instead give you a whole town. It even has side quests now. This is a bold move for many reasons. Firstly, it goes against the principles of all survival horror games and maybe even was a bit ahead of its time. It's a strange sensation to play a survival horror game and to have so many options. That's not to say exploration itself is not fun because it certainly can be and lets the game reward you for your bravery. I was able to find sniper rifle parts and completely brand new weapons by being brave and exploring. It feels very satisfying to now own a much more powerful gun because you chose to explore and knowing you would have missed out on it otherwise. It also is fun in the sense that you come across new and horrifying monsters this way. I found the crazy stabby lady just hanging out in the wild and many others. It was fun to try and sneak up on all of them and see how I could who I could beat and who I couldn't, not knowing how they would react and what reward would I get after I beat them. Of course, exploration in games is about rewards and you find many things which of course are a big help. Ammunition, health, and you now have the ability to craft items. Enemies kill you very easily in this game, so each bullet counts and finding items to craft more ammo is a good incentive. You're also forced to avoid areas sometimes as well when you see too many creatures lurking about. Giving this much freedom to the player does come at a cost however and hence why many fans did not like this aspect. Survival horror is a very hard niche to get correct and the most challenging genre in my opinion. Balancing the power fantasy with horror is very hard to do. Developers normally need strict control to pull that off making you weak in the right moments and stronger in the next. Making sure you are just powerful enough to get the job done, but not so much so that you no longer fear the game and it becomes an action shooter. Such open design also means there are much less scripted scenes to give you that classic jump scare. While I enjoyed exploring at times, had my rush with certain enemies and even finding new guns, I would have personally preferred a more middle ground approach. I liked how the areas of the first game were structured. Everything was exactly where it needed to be, and I was always on edge. I really enjoyed that first village you're in, where you fight the chainsaw guy, having to explore the houses beforehand and stock up with the crossbow to even stand a chance was a good time. If the evil within 2 was that area, but the whole game, 
I would have not complained, or even if it was open just a bit more. I've always enjoyed linear games where it's obvious where you want to go, but you can see a couple of stops on the way you can check out. Having an entire town to explore was an overcorrection to some players, simply wanting a slightly less linear experience. One thing I disliked, and for once even reviewers agree with me, was the game's pacing issues. In the first game, Chainsaw Guy is there, the butcher, and will take your head off immediately if you drop your guard, forcing you to learn to sneak slash hide straight away and running for your life. It set the tone immediately. The Evil Within 2 has an opening scene where you are in a fire and is short, plus sets the stage. Okay, but after that, you are running around a big mansion, not doing anything apart from observing. Things disappear and you're going up and down corridors for ages. I understand delayed gratification and easing into things, but the game repeatedly makes you experience what I call an interactive storytelling experience. Instead of a cutscene playing out that maybe would only need 45 to 60 seconds to get his point across, instead has you running up and down halls for about 10 minutes before letting you proceed. This is unfortunately a regular occurrence. It's not rare to find explorable houses in the town you can freely explore and looking for loot. Sometimes you trigger a memory or a story element while in the house. Suddenly, you are literally locked inside the house. Now you need to interact with the correct item in the house to trigger a scene. Now, you are still stuck in the house as you need to now interact with the next correct scene in the correct order to trigger the next memory. I often found myself going around in circles inside of houses as I tried to figure out what it is the developers actually wanted me to interact with. This really puts an artificial halt on the flow of things and a simple cutscene would have been much more entertaining. Due to the first main bad guy in this game, it accidentally made the devs turn the classical The Evil Within scary locations to nothing more than prop scenes and it killed the believability of its world. Allow me to explain. We know in the first game, Sebastian, the awesome detective you play as, is thrown from one scary location to the next. Even though the locations kept changing, apart from some end game locations, it was always wrapped up in realism. So you could be in a scary looking dungeon or a spooky forest, surrounded by gritty war textures and everything looks ancient and detailed and gritty and realistic as you see all those little bumps and textures. In The Evil Within 2, the main bad guy is a crazy murderous photographer. He sees death as art and so likes to kill people freeze that moment in time because he has the power of the core behind him and forever immortalizes that moment in a strange animation cycle of forever dying and taking a snappy photo of it for his sick collection. This means he likes a good lighting setup, so you will often be in locations that are very clean looking, like a museum with velvet red curtains and literally staging lights and cameras are everywhere. This results in you often running around pitch black locations that only have stage lights and other oddly clean locations with massive curtains. A lot of the time, you feel like you're just playing your part in a play and that's not a feeling you want in a survival horror game. Ladies and gentlemen, seems we are at the halfway point of the video, so my usual quick reminder that if you feel video games are about escapism and not activism, please, please, subscribe right now as you're watching to help empower voices such as my own that just want video games to be games no more no less and if you want to support me further i do now have channel memberships where you can get a cool badge beside your name and custom emoji like these anyways thanks for hearing me out there is no urgency as you just played your part and felt like the whole game was a stage if instead of complete darkness and all these items around that remind you that you're playing a game at all moments, if this crazy camera guy put you in a more realistic location with some grit like the first game, that would have been much more immersive. Am I playing the new The Evil Within game? Or is this a tech demo of random 3D objects we had left over during development? Let's say another nice thing about this game, because even though it does a lot more wrong than it does right, I do want to at least give credit to the little improvements I did enjoy. 
So the original game had the bolts that acted as bombs and went off when it detected movements nearby. It was pretty much a spiky ball that exploded. In The Evil Within 2, this has been adjusted, but in a good sense. While aiming your crossbow to where you want to fire it, it will show you a line to let you know where the tripwire will appear. This in turn letting you be exact and set up your own traps. A nice moment where they grabbed something that worked and just improved it further. They also very early on patched in a free first person mode you can toggle on and off at any moment during play. I thought this was a great free addition. It's a good looking game and this will let you get closer to the action and give you some replay value. Anyone who loves this game, eventually you can play in a completely new perspective. One other positive aspect I want to mention before addressing further issues, and I guess this is a slight spoiler for the new enemy type. Anyway, eventually you have these flamethrower guys that are such a cool design and they are strong. They are tall, scary looking, and when you meet them, everything is already on fire. The coding of these bad guys is great because if you see them aim their flamethrower at you and start shooting that fire, that means you 100% are within reach and it will hit you like a fireball. It made some awesome tension as I would have to run to the side each time they took a shot at me. They also took a lot to take down. I almost ran out of ammunition trying to do it and a further reward was realizing if I take down enough of these guys, I can eventually build a flamethrower of my own. Again, another incentive to be brave in the game where you could just run away from every single one of them, but if you take them down, if you face the fear head on, you literally get more firepower for it. Oh, and there was another enemy type which I enjoyed as well. They were like dogs with multiple heads. They moved really fast and would jump on you slash eat you pretty quickly. They messed you up on your first encounter and after stalk you throughout the town. You will simply hear them snarling, making you stop dead in your tracks as you rotate the camera carefully to find out where they are hiding. Sometimes I avoided the area completely after or other times I tried to take them on. Oh, and I have to share another satisfying moment I had with the crazy meds knife lady. So we established she means business and took a lot to take down. One time I found her on a train and she had not noticed me yet. I took out my newly built sniper rifle and I took her head clean off in a single shot. I can't express how satisfying that was knowing how strong she is otherwise. Now. Back to the constructive criticism because this game is far from perfect and feels very different from the first. Even when you first boot up the game, something feels wrong immediately and it turns out the default field of view is way too close to the character. This was a really poor choice to make because at the very least you should make returning players feel right at home. Something else present in the original and removed from this sequel was fun with matches. Throw in a match on a downed enemy in the first was a highlight players all enjoyed and could be used strategically to even burn nearby enemies. This feature is completely gone now. Another odd choice was how they decided to handle some loading screens. So using computers you could jump from one location to the other. So first you would interact with the PC and be brought to yep another all black surrounding place as you saw maybe a white tree or two randomly exist as you see the loading percentage in the corner. Continuously again reminded that what you are playing is not real. Once loaded, you're still not done. Now another PC has appeared in front of you, go and interact with it again, and finally you're in the new place. Between interactive story parts with bosses and key moments, getting trapped in locations or houses, and even having the loading screen having three different parts, the pace is horrible. Corridors you have to run down only to predictably have to turn around and run back in the opposite direction as a voiceover narration attempts to taunt you. Having coffee at save points was an awesome little touch. Very relatable as an adult. You could have gone through torture today, but you know what? If coffee is waiting for you, maybe you can survive another day. I'm Greek and we live on coffee. That's no exaggeration. Another example of an overcorrection and honestly, I think that Evil Within 2 would have done so much better if they had focused more on making the game better instead of addressing every single complaint haters had, was what they did with bosses. 
So in the first The Evil Within game, the bosses range from challenging to if you die less than 20 times, things are going well. Many were one hit killers and you had to retry so many times until you knew exactly what to do. Now, a middle ground here would have been to make the bosses easier, but not easy. Now, I kid you not, I found most bosses in the Evil Within 2 easier than the normal creatures roaming the street. Two or three of them chasing me down the street had a better chance of killing me than 95% of all boss encounters in the game, and that's not right. It was usually just a matter of doing what the developers wanted you to do, then fighting for your life. Many were hide and seek, so while hiding the boss would always stop just shy of discovering you most of the time, and the layout of the area made it obvious where the developers wanted you to go. Now. I'm not one of those players who looks down at those who don't like a challenge and yeah, some were a bit too hard in the first and became more frustrating than anything else. However, this is not a middle ground. Just how having a whole town to explore is an overcorrection to feedback that the game was a bit linear, this is another overcorrection to bosses were too hard to now they are all easy. I normally beat bosses on my first try and maybe I would die once. Only one boss battle challenged me throughout the entire game. An odd choice the developers made was an adjustment to one of the bolts for your crossbow. So in the first you have your smoke bolts. Great for the more strategic player, aim and shoot at your enemies to cover them in smoke. During the confusion, sneak up and stealth kill them. Upgrade this item further to increase how long they are stunned for to get even more kills in. In the Evil Within 2, you can't do a stealth kill. It literally only distracts the enemy for a moment, and if you want to do a stealth kill, you need to upgrade that bolt three times before the game gives you permission to do that. They literally took away the main feature and point of the smoke bolt to resell it to you because they didn't know how to get you to want to upgrade it. This annoyed me because I didn't realize this at first, so I kept using the bolt and when I failed the stealth takedowns, I thought I just messed up, but no. Read the text and it tells you in the upgrade menu it's literally ward off. Oh, and I just remembered another feature I like. So, in town, you will sometimes find puddles of water or a fire hydrant you can turn on. If enemies stand in the water and you fire an electrical bolt, everyone gets zapped. And you also find drums of oil on the ground as well. Feels good to lure enemies in and shoot the oil, watching the flames cook up them freaks. Speaking of reading and instructions, we have to talk about the handholding this game does. Apart from bosses becoming too easy, each time you unlock a move or get a new item, a pop-up appears explaining how to use the item. The issue is, it explains too much. It will tell you what the item is, what its base use is, and even maybe mention what else you might want to consider doing with the item. The lack of confidence the developers had with this second game is really sad, and it sold even less than the first, so trying to address the haters did not work. The first game was seriously misunderstood and became popular to wrongly hate on. Again, you will really enjoy my first review of that if you haven't watched it already. Now, in case it's not clear, The Evil Within 2 is actually a fun game. It looks and it runs great. It has great monster designs and fun moments. It also feels more like a spin-off title to The Evil Within instead of a direct sequel. Now, story-wise, this is indeed The Evil Within 2, but the gameplay is different enough that it feels like an interesting side experiment. This means that those who played The Evil Within 2 first can't really appreciate the first entry, and it's also true the other way around. Whichever entry you prefer, the main reasons for that is not found in the next game. I think both games can be enjoyed for what they are. The first entry is the superior survival horror game, but the second is still fun in its own right. If you have made it this far, I'm actually thinking of doing a third video in the series, combining the best aspects of the first and second game for what The Evil Within 3 could be. Now, 
Microsoft still owns the rights to the specific franchise, even though Tango Gameworks is with another company now. And so even though a third entry will likely never happen, I think a perfect The Evil Within game actually lies between the best aspects of The Evil Within 1 and The Evil Within 2. And if you'd like me to do a separate video on that, let me know and we can just make up the best The Evil Within 3 game. That likely will never happen, but still sounds like a bit of fun. Anyways, that's it. Thank you so much for joining me. God bless you all. Take care. Thank you to anyone who has subscribed while watching this. I appreciate each and every one of you. And um, I'll see you all next time. All right. Bye-bye.